Dead America, Portland Part 5 Dead America, The Northwest Invasion, Book 2 Written by Derek Slayton Narrated by Aaron Smith Chapter 1 Day Zero Plus Twenty Two The dull roar of a ten-thousand-strong zombie horde murmured in the distance. The situation was dire. After the bombs had dropped, all the hard work from weeks past was obliterated, coming back to haunt them as an army of the undead marched towards their home. The clock was ticking. They only had four hours before the zombie mass overtook the crossroads, blocking their only means of escape. If that happened, the best-case scenario for the apartment complex was that they'd slowly waste away from starvation. The worst case would be the horde overtaking them and breaking in. Calvin swallowed hard. So, we're really going to evacuate? He asked hoarsely. The wiry sniper fumbled with his pocket, pulling out a thin joint and jamming it between his lips. We don't have a choice, Zion replied, nodding and straightening his broad shoulders. And if we don't slow them down, we're not going to be able to get everybody out safely. Mateo rubbed his forehead. Fire worked pretty well back at the complex, right? He asked, hope in his lightly accented voice. Why not give that a shot? There isn't going to be nearly enough flammable liquid left to put a dent in them, Zion replied, poking his cheek with his tongue. Calvin flicked his lighter a few times, finally managing to light up his joint, and took a deep, thoughtful drag. What if we used it to thin out the crowd a bit? He mused through a puff of smoke. Wouldn't that help with the loppers? It certainly couldn't hurt, Tori weighed in, pushing her glasses up her nose. The lopper her and her college friends had invented was a helicopter-inspired machine that had the potential to buy them some needed time. We're just kind of making this up as we go, so we don't know how it's going to react to hitting numerous corpses at once. The less strain we can put on the loppers, the longer they'll last. Jermaine linked his fingers together and rested his palms on top of his dark, bald head. I can handle that, he piped up. I'll load up everything I can and start thinning them out. When you do, throw them as far as you can, all around the horde, Tori instructed, curling a lock of blonde hair behind her ear. We need to create some pockets if we can. The moaning grew increasingly louder in the distance, pushing Zion into action. He took a deep breath and turned to Jermaine, who was wearing a digital watch. Mind if I borrow your watch for a little bit? He asked, motioning to his companion's wrist. Jermaine divested himself of the watch and handed it over. Zion fiddled with it for a few moments, finally managing to set a four-hour timer. Appreciate it, he said as he fastened it to his own wrist. Let's head back to the complex and regroup. We got a lot of work to do and not much time to do it in. The group nodded and piled into the truck. Zion fired it up and sped back towards the complex. He glanced in the rearview mirror, thankful to see an empty road. At least, for the time being. As they pulled into the garage, rumbling over the charred remains of the ghouls who had tried to breach the parking deck earlier, he pulled up next to Tori's friends, who were hard at work on various machinery. Tori jumped out and rushed over to them. Drop what you're doing right now, she demanded pushing her glasses up her nose. We need to start working on the lappers. Her friends blinked at her confused, but concerned at the tense tone in her voice. What's going on? Jack asked, brow furrowed. Harold shook his head. We don't even have the engines for those yet. Well, you're about to get them, Zion replied as he caught up. Tori? Missy asked, voice shaky. The blonde glanced at Zion, silently asking permission to fill them in. He nodded his approval and she clasped her hands in front of her, taking a deep breath. There's a whole lot of those things headed our way, she began. If we don't slow them down, a lot of people are going to be trapped here, so I need you to focus and start putting them together as quickly as you can. Reinforce them as much as humanly possible, because they're going to take a beating. The trio of students nodded firmly, and then set to work like a hive of busy bees. Tori turned to Zion. I'm going to help them. But please come see me before you leave, she said. He nodded. Will do. He promised and then waved for Calvin and Matteo to follow him to the stairwell. My truck is on the exterior lot, Jermaine piped up. I'll burn as many of them as I can. Thanks, bud, Zion replied, and held up his wrist. And I'll take good care of your watch, too. Jermaine chuckled. 
I know you, he said. If it doesn't come back with bloodstains on it, I'm going to be disappointed. They exchanged a fist bump before parting ways. Zion led Calvin and Mateo up the stairs quickly, headed for Cheryl's office. When they walked in, she sat in the corner at a radio, repeatedly trying to get Wendy on the line. Wendy, do you copy? she demanded, voice frustrated as if she'd been at it for a while. Anybody home? Anybody? Bueller? She tossed the microphone angrily down on the table. Zion crossed his arms. Nobody home, I'm guessing? he asked. No, they're either out of range or have the radios off, Cheryl growled. He cocked his head. They'll be to White Salmon soon enough, he reminded her. You been able to reach them? Nobody in Edward's camp is reading me either, she replied. Calvin clucked his tongue. Did you try fingers? No, just tried Edward's frequency, Cheryl said, pointing at him. But that's a good idea. She swiveled around and fiddled with the dials before getting the frequency right. Fingers, this is Cheryl from Zion's camp. Do you copy? There were a few moments of tense silence before the line crackled and Fingers' voice came through. Go for Fingers. Hang on, Cheryl said back, waving maniacally at Zion. I'm going to put Zion on. He grabbed the microphone. Have you heard from Wendy yet? He asked. Wendy? Fingers replied. Who the hell is Wendy? All right, brother, Zion replied with a sigh. I'm going to give you the nickel version, because you ain't got much time. Did you hear those bombs that went off a few hours ago? Yeah, we were trying to figure out what in the hell that was. Fingers came back. Zion leaned on the table. They were missiles, he explained. And they fucked our shit up good. We pulled survivors out of Wendy's camp and sent them your way. Whoa, whoa, sent them our way? Fingers demanded. Edward isn't going to be happy about that. Zion's gaze darkened. He's going to have to get over it, because we're coming that way too. What the hell is going on there? came the reply. Zion took a deep breath. We got 50,000 of those things headed our way, and if we don't get our people out in the next four hours or so, we ain't getting them out, he said. There was a long silence, and then Fingers finally said, Fucking hell, man. He let out a deep whoosh of breath through the line. What do you need me to do? For starters, when you get a hold of Wendy, you tell her to turn around and haul ass back here with those transport vehicles. Zion replied. We don't have anything big enough to move our people. We're low on that too, Fingers admitted. We drained all the diesel from the buses to power the generators. Wish I could be more help on that, but I can't. Zion shook his head. No worries. How many loads do you need? Fingers asked. Zion glanced at Cheryl, and she scribbled some numbers quickly on the back of a piece of paper. Once she was done, she held up three fingers. Three, he said. There was another momentary pause. You aren't going to be able to do that in four hours if they're coming all the way here. It was a statement, not a question. Zion rubbed his forehead. I remember that drive, and there wasn't really a whole lot out there, he said. And I don't really feel comfortable leaving vulnerable people on the side of the road. Don't blame you there, Fingers agreed. Those things are fucking everywhere, and by the time you really get going, it'll be nighttime, so even guards aren't going to help much on the side of the road. He paused. But wait, wait. There was a sound of papers rustling around through the radio, and finally he said, Bridge of the Guards! Zion's brow furrowed, and he looked around at the others, receiving blank stares all around. I have no idea what that means, he admitted. Bridge of the Guards, man, Fingers replied, speaking quickly. It's about halfway between us, Toll Bridge over the river. They turned it into a little tourist trap a while back. Not a whole lot there, but there is a decent-sized hotel. Zion nodded thoughtfully. Which we can use to stash people while we get everyone to safety, he added. Exactly, Fingers said. However, Zion groaned. Fuck. What now? I found a report on it from a couple weeks ago, came the reply. It's overrun with those things. Zion sighed. You're killing me, man. Don't worry, Fingers said quickly. If you can send me some people... I can sneak up there with a few party favors and help you clear it out. Zion glanced at Mateo. You think you can handle that? If that's where you need me, his companion replied with a firm nod. Zion smiled at him in appreciation. All right, I'm sending you a few guys, he said into the radio. Mateo is your point man, 
He's a bladed badass, so you can't miss him. Look forward to it, Fingers replied. If memory serves, there's a little restaurant across the street from the hotel. Let's rendezvous there. Mateo gave a thumbs up and Zion nodded. He'll be there, he said. Appreciate it, man. Fingers took a deep breath. Any time, bud, he replied. Any time. The line went silent and Zion tossed the microphone on the table. Cheryl, does that timeline even work? He asked. I didn't want to say anything with him on the line, as we don't have any other options. She held up a hand as she finished scribbling some more math on the scrap sheet. Okay, she began, shaking her head. Assuming that the Horde is reaching the crossroads in four hours, and assuming Wendy gets back here within ninety minutes, she scribbled some more. Forty-five minutes each way to the hotel? Shit. We need four and a half hours to get that last group loaded up and on the move. Zion drew his bottom lip between his teeth and nodded slowly. Thirty minutes he said thoughtfully. We can buy thirty minutes. Let's get those engines for the lappers and we'll be in business, Calvin piped up. Cheryl swiveled to face them. Engines? she asked. Wait, where are you boys going? she demanded. Super Garden Center, Zion replied. She shook her head immediately, letting out a deep sigh. Well, if you're going to go there, you might as well get everything you possibly can, she replied knowing there was no time to argue. There's a moving truck place about a half a mile up on Y Street. They should have some trailers you can hitch to the back of your truck. That's a detour worth taking, Zion agreed. Mateo raised a hand. What about me? Cheryl, see if you can round up a few boys to help Mateo clear the hotel, Zion said. She nodded and got to her feet. Do you want some to go with you too? He shook his head. No, we're doing a hit and run to get this stuff, he replied. And besides, we need to get people and supplies staged in the parking garage. Every second is going to count. We need to be ready. She nodded and waved to Mateo. Okay, if you want to follow me, I'll get you set up, she said, and then pointed to Zion and Calvin. You two stay safe. Always, Zion replied as she left with Mateo in tow. He and Calvin went back to the stairs in silence, walking with purpose towards their daunting task. When they reached the garage, the students were furiously at work on the loppers. They welded large metal poles together, sticking out like a multi-pronged helicopter blade. As Zion and Calvin headed to their truck, the foreman noticed Tori approaching, and he elbowed his companion. I think your girl wants some sugar, he whispered, and then hopped into the driver's seat. Calvin shoved his hands in his pockets, nervous as she reached him. Time to go to the mall? she asked pushing her glasses up her nose. He tried to act casual and suave, but came up short with his country boy twang. Yeah, Zion and I are gonna go get what you need. Just remember, the bigger, the better, she replied. I'll get you a big one, don't you worry, he said. And then they both paused before he blushed, as she laughed at the double entendre. The mower will be big, I, but I mean that's not, not to say I'm small, I am... Um... She laughed harder. And then Calvin joined in, unable to stop himself. He took her hand, pulling it up to his chest and stroking her knuckles gently. The laughter died away, and they stared at each other warmly. Tori licked her lips, the horn blared, startling them both. Jesus, man, will you kiss her already? Zion bellowed from the driver's side window. We got shit to do! The two blushed and smiled shyly, and then Calvin leaned in brushing his lips against hers. It was short and sweet, but spoke more than either could put into words. He pulled away and darted into the truck, and Tori gave a little wave before rushing off to work. Calvin fumbled with his seat belt and then noticed Zion grinning widely at him. What? he demanded. Proud of my player! Zion exclaimed. Yeah! His friend chuckled and shook his head. Let's get moving, he mumbled. Yes, sir, Mr. Player, Zion declared, and fired up the truck. He shot Calvin one more wink before peeling out of the garage. Chapter 2 Zion and Calvin stopped about a block away from the moving place, the only light coming from a solar-powered streetlight above the parking lot. There were a few zombies milling about in the lot, only faint shadows of movement in the distance. 
Got a couple of them hanging out on the corner, but can't see much past that, he said. Calvin looked around the side of the truck, making sure it was safe to step out. He popped out and raised his rifle, looking through the scope. As he peered into the darkness, he could make out several moving figures about fifty yards from the moving business. Can't tell exactly how many there are, he replied, but it looks like it's more than we want to deal with. Zion nodded. We're gonna have to act quick then, he said, and got out of the truck. He motioned for his companion to switch sides. Come on, you drive. Calvin closed the passenger door and jogged around to the driver's seat, and Zion hopped up into the truck bed. He opened the back window. What do you want me to do? Calvin asked. Zion raised his trusty wooden weapon. Drive up alongside them and I'll handle the rest, he said with a grin. Then find the first trailer you can and back it up. The sniper nodded. I'll cover you while you get it hitched up, he said. Zion smacked the herd and Calvin hit the gas, speeding off towards the moving truck depot. As he reached the lot, he quickly turned in, moving just to the left of the two ghouls. Zion leaned over and swung from the bed, catching one zombie on the side of the head before stabbing down into the top of the other one. Calvin scanned the lot, finally seeing a ten-foot trailer beside the building. Got one, hang on, he called, and flipped the truck into reverse, flooring it. Zion widened his stance to keep his balance, and then moved to the back of the bed, motioning left and right to help Calvin line up the hitch properly. We're good, he finally called. Cover me! He hopped out of the truck and grabbed the heavy metal trailer. He lifted it and dragged it towards the hitch, straining under the weight. Come on, come on, he urged himself, and gave a great heave, lifting it up. Calvin stood on the edge of the door, scanning the lot. One creature emerged from the darkness, rotted face illuminated by the spotlight. The sniper quickly aimed and put it down with a clean headshot. Zion startled, arms still straining as he tried to line up the trailer. We got incoming? Just a straggler, Calvin replied. He glanced to the left and noticed several creatures staggering into the lot. Okay, more than just a straggler, he amended. How much time you need? Just another minute, he grunted, and finally managed to line up the trailer over the hitch and drop it. He fiddled with it a bit as Calvin dropped a few of the closest zombies and then shook his head. Fuck it, going to have to do, he muttered, and then clambered back up into the truck bed. We're good, let's roll, he yelled. Calvin ducked back into the cab and floored it, moving away from the zombies and back the way they'd come. When they made it a few blocks away to relative safety, he stopped so Zion could get back inside. How's it looking? Calvin asked. His companion shrugged as he jumped into the passenger seat. Well, it's still behind the truck, he replied, so I guess it's good. Good enough for me, the sniper agreed. Zion jerked his thumb over his shoulder. You good handling this? he asked. Oh yeah, just like I'm back on the farm, Calvin assured him with a grin. Zion returned the smile. Then drive us off to the mall then, farm boy. I thought I was a player, the sniper asked, raising an eyebrow. Zion chuckled. Only when your woman is around, he said. Calvin rolled his eyes playfully and then turned down a side street, heading around the mini horde. He drove slowly, making sure the trailer was properly attached. Finally, after several blocks, they reached the edge of the mall parking lot. The City of Roses Mall was a mammoth structure that housed five anchor stores and another two hundred smaller ones. It was a two-story beast, state-of-the-art circa 1995, with multiple entrances outside of the anchor stores. Now, it was home to a few thousand zombies. The two men sat in the truck staring at their target, the Super Garden Center, one of the newer anchor stores. Calvin popped the truck into park and stepped out with his stomach clenched, raising his rifle. His heart sank as he scanned the store through his scope. The interior of the store was dimly lit via several emergency lights, as were most areas of the mall. Solar-powered and installed as an anti-theft deterrent, it was a boon, and the only reason the boys had any chance of succeeding. While the lights were vital, unfortunately they had the byproduct of attracting huge numbers of zombies. There were easily hundreds just at the garden centre, with even more inside the mall. While there was tremendous movement inside the store, at least there were only a handful of ghouls outside. Calvin scanned the doors, four sets of double glass, with several of them open. 
Rigid steel beams reinforced the frames. Well, the good news is, he began, taking a deep breath, we have lights. Zion pursed his lips. And the bad? It appears as though they've attracted every zombie in a five-mile radius, the sniper replied, and sat back down in the driver's seat with a huff. They sat in silence for a moment, and then he glanced over at his friend. How are we looking on time? Zion checked his watch. Three twenty left on the clock. Calvin scrubbed his hands down his face. Ideas? Kinda hoping you had one, Zion admitted. The sniper sighed. Originally, I was thinking we'd just drive right in through the front door, he suggested. But it would be a hell of a risk with those beams. Agreed, Zion said. But if we can find a loading door entrance... Calvin nodded thoughtfully. Attack it from the inside, he finished. I like it. Let's see what we can find. He popped the truck back into gear and they drove around the outer edge of the lot, headlights off to avoid detection. As they drove, they stared at the mall, seeing some smaller entrances illuminated with several zombies coming in and out of the building. They had no luck until they reached the other side of the ball. One of the department store anchors had a gaping hole through the front of the store, mangled metal hanging from the top of the structure, with a ten-foot-wide hole resulting from the crash. A few bodies lay scattered on the ground in front of the doors. Looks like somebody really wanted in, Calvin muttered. Zion nodded. Looks like they had a head of steam, too, he said. Let's see what I can see, Calvin said and parked again. He hopped out after a cursory sweep and then inspected the hole with his scope. Several zombies roamed around it, but he was more interested on the inside. Looks like whoever was driving was a speed demon, because they got pretty deep into the store. Zion raised an eyebrow. How deep? he asked. Can we get the truck and trailer through? Deep enough that I can't see it, Calvin replied. Shouldn't be a problem to get inside. Question is, then what? Zion shook his head. Man, I only came to this mall once, he admitted. Only thing I really remember is that it's a big old bitch. Good to know we have enough room to drive, though, Calvin pointed out. That's not a problem, Zion agreed. What is a problem is going to be figuring out how to buy ourselves enough time to load the mowers into the trailer. They sat in silence for a moment, contemplating. I got an idea, Calvin finally said, but you're gonna think I'm crazy. Zion chuckled, shaking his head. I already think that, so you don't have to worry about your reputation. Well, the sniper began, I figure we can Blues Brothers it through the mall, park it beside the mowers in the garden center, then get to higher ground in the mall proper, and draw them out of the store. Zion nodded thoughtfully. Those things aren't the most graceful creatures on God's green earth, so there shouldn't be too many of them on the second floor. That's my thought too, Calvin said. So we get in, fight our way to the second floor, draw them out, and buy ourselves a few minutes to load up. Zion's eyebrows rose at his friend. That's a crazy fucking idea, he said. Yeah, I know, Calvin replied sheepishly. Just trying to think outside the box. They sat in another contemplative silence for a moment, and then Zion looked at his watch again. Three hours and twelve minutes remaining. I hate to say it, though, he admitted but it's the best idea we got. Calvin blinked at him in shock, having a hard time comprehending that his dumbass idea was the one they were going with. Just make me a promise, he finally said. What's that? Zion asked. The sniper held up a hand. If we survive this, he began, let me come up with another idea when we're doing a raid. Don't want this to be the best idea I ever come up with. If we pull this off, Zion replied with a grin, this will be the best idea you will ever have, because it worked. You may want to retire from the idea business. Calvin tilted his head back and forth. Good point, he said. So, you ready to do this? Let's do it, Zion replied. They shared a fist bump and Calvin popped the truck into gear. He crept along the parking lot, lining them up with the hole in the entrance. As they approached, several zombies began coming out of the hole, attracted to the noise. Hang on, Calvin cried and punched the gas. The vehicle rapidly picked up speed and he flipped on the headlights as they approached the entrance. Several more zombies emerged, creating a soft wall of rotting flesh. The truck bounced as they hit the curb, sending it and the trailer flying a foot or so off of the ground. 
landing hard and slamming into the first creature. With a rapid thump, 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 they ploughed over the ghouls, sending them crumbling underneath the vehicle. As soon as they cleared the entrance, Calvin made a quick left turn, running over the clothing displays, one of which cracked the windshield. He hit a couple more before finding the walkway leading through the department store. Calvin got on it, looking straight through the store to see the entrance to the main part of the mall. Several zombies still remained in their way, but they were no match for the massive truck. They cleared the threshold and reached the main part of the mall. The second floor was a rim around the gigantic first floor, where hundreds of zombies spread about like undead Christmas shoppers. The engine revved, echoing throughout the cavernous structure. As Calvin navigated, doing his best to avoid hitting too many ghouls and kiosks, Zion fixated on the second floor. Shit, he growled. Calvin didn't peel his eyes away from his task. What? he demanded. There's a whole lot of those fuckers on the second floor, Zion replied. The sniper glanced up, seeing a few dozen lining the rails, and then looked back to his task, gripping the steering wheel with white knuckles. The job had just gotten a lot tougher, but there was no going back now. As they passed the food court in the center of the mall, they saw a horde of creatures walking between the tables, every one of them heading their way. Calvin sped up, attempting to put a little distance between them. Finally, they saw the super garden center at the end of the hall, the entire front entrance wide open, and dozens of zombies in the way. They sped past an escalator about forty yards away from the entrance to the store. That's our way up to the second floor, Zion said, motioning. Calvin glanced in the rear view, seeing hundreds of creatures all heading their way. We're gonna have to haul ass then if we're gonna make it back in time, he said, and sped through the front entrance to the garden center. He knocked several creatures to the ground and then skidded to a stop just inside the store. Where are the mowers? he asked. They looked around frantically, and Zion finally pointed to the display towards the back right side of the store. There, he cried, to the right. Calvin didn't even look, just hit the gas and headed that way, slamming through a display before finding the walkway again. As they raced towards the mowers, there were two more zombies in the aisle. He sped up, crashing through the two of them before slamming on the brakes beside the display. Four large riding lawn mowers sat in a row. Sales stickers still displayed on the front of all of them. The two men quickly jumped out of the truck and Zion grabbed his bludgeon from the back while Calvin quickly checked his rifle. Follow me through them, Zion said and took off running. The sniper followed close behind as they headed up the aisle and zombies began to emerge from the displays. Zion stepped up to the first one, a former Super Garden Center employee who had numerous bite marks all over her body. With one swing, he put her out of her misery. As the weapon hit, Zion saw another eight zombies directly in front of him on the walkway. He quickly darted off of the path and into the displays, giving them some minor cover. As they ran, the creatures adjusted course, reaching through the potted plants and tools, clawed fingers grasping at them as they went. They tore towards the front of the store, reaching ten yards away when Zion spotted a mini horde blocking the path at the entrance. He tossed his weapon behind him. Catch! he cried and Calvin managed to snatch the weapon out of the air despite his surprise. With his hands free, Zion picked up a large metal display that stretched out in four directions, holding gardening shirts. He put it in front of him as he ran, slamming the crossed end into several ghouls and clearing a hole for them to fly through. Once they cleared it, he threw the metal rack aside, taking out even more creatures. They broke through into the main part of the mall, giving themselves about five yards of distance from the zombies at the entrance before they turned to follow their running meals. Hundreds headed towards them from the center portion, closing in on the escalator. Keep up, player, Zion barked, and they broke into a dead sprint, running straight for the escalator. Hearts pounding, legs pumping. They ran as hard as they could, ducking the outstretched hands of the few creatures reaching for them on the way. As they reached the escalators, Calvin followed Zion up one side, just before the horde reached the bottom. At the halfway point, several creatures from upstairs started to come down their side, filing one after the other. Zion stopped, Calvin barely smacking into the back of him. What are we waiting on? he demanded. Get ready, Zion replied, holding up a hand, because we're going to jump over to the other side. When we do, haul ass. 
because it ain't going to take them long to catch on. The sniper slung his rifle over his shoulder, looking at the three-foot gap between the two sets of stationary stairs. Zion remained focused on the creatures ahead of them, shambling their way down. When they were within five steps of them, he made his move. Now! Zion yelled, and the duo moved in sync, leaping across to the other side of the escalator. Zion landed perfectly, but Calvin's foot caught on the median, and he stumbled. His companion grabbed him by the collar, yanking him up to a standing. They quickly rushed up the stairs as the zombies reached from the other side, confused that their meal had escaped. The creatures at the top that hadn't filtered down the other side had changed course, moving towards them. Zion snatched his weapon from Calvin's hand and whipped it in front of him, using it like a battering ram to send a couple of them flying back as they reached the landing. The duo made a hard left towards the wall of stores before continuing towards the centre of the mall. There were about two dozen zombies behind them, with a smattering of creatures in front. Any time you want to start shooting, Sion barked. We gotta get them out of the store. Calvin didn't wait to be asked a second time, aiming towards the centre of the mall, selecting a target and squeezing the trigger. The blast echoed throughout the large space as one of the creatures dropped to the ground. Zion turned his attention towards the escalator zombies that were following them. He delivered several quick, decisive blows that dropped them to the ground. Before too long, however, the ones on the escalator had cleared the stairs, and were quickly becoming too much for him to handle on his own. Let's head up, he yelled. Gotta keep them moving. They took off about twenty yards, Calvin stopping and firing twice in rapid succession, keeping the noise up and the threat ahead at bay. As he aimed for a third one, he paused, drawing his companion's attention from the trailing horde. What is it? Zion asked. Calvin gulped. We're in trouble, he said. His friend looked ahead and saw about sixty zombies coming around the corner at the centre of the mall. Where the fuck did they come from? he demanded. Doesn't matter, they're here! Calvin cried. Zion looked back, noticing several zombies had poured out of the storefronts, increasing the number pursuing them. He frantically looked around, seeing a clothing store with an open gate just ahead, a small chain with a door about twenty feet wide. There, Zion pointed, into the clothing store. They tore towards it as the zombies began to close in from both sides. Zion ran in first, quickly working his way through the displays to make sure they were alone inside. There were plenty of bloodstains and overturned displays, showing that at one time there'd been a hell of a struggle in there with someone not coming out on top. While he did his sweep, Calvin grabbed the metal pole and used it to close the gate. He slammed it shut moments before the zombies reached them, securing it to the ground. He took a few steps back as dozens of creatures pressed up against it, scraping the flesh from their fingers as they tried to stick them through the small metal openings. Zion came up to join him. How are we looking? he asked. Calvin swallowed hard. Trying to remain hopeful that there is a back exit, he admitted. Haven't checked, Zion replied, but we're alone in here unless something is in the storeroom. They backed away from the gate, relieved that it was holding, but concerned they might be trapped. They went to the storeroom door and Calvin put his hand on the knob as Zion readied his weapon and nodded. The sniper threw open the door and Zion burst inside, looking around at the horrific scene. A mangled, bloody corpse sprawled on the ground mostly eaten, but still moving. He shook his head as he walked over to it, unable to tell at all what the person had looked like before they'd been attacked. Don't know who this was, he muttered, but they were a hell of a fighter if they were able to lock themselves up with that kind of damage. He stood over the zombie as it gave a gurgled moan and tried to reach for his ankle. He brought his weapon down on top of its chewed-up head, destroying it. The two looked around the darkened storeroom, unable to see much of anything without any lights. Calvin headed back to the register, fumbling around the shelves underneath until he found a flashlight. Got a light, he said, returning to the dark room. He flicked it on and scanned the room, and both men's hearts soared as they spotted a back door. Hope that's not just a closet, Zion said, and they approached it carefully. He unlocked it and then cracked it open, peeking through. There was a long cinder block hallway with several other doors, a dead end about forty yards ahead with a door. He gently closed it and backed up. We got a way out, he said. 
But first, I think we need to draw some attention our way, don't you? Calvin nodded, wiping his forehead. Plus, I could use a breather, he admitted. Weak, bud, weak, Zion said playfully, shaking his head. If you are going to keep your girl pleased, you gotta have to work on that cardio. The sniper chuckled. You have such a one-track mind, he accused. Zion clapped him on the back. Come on, let's go cause a ruckus. They headed to the gate and began yelling. Calvin stuck his gun through one of the holes and fired at point-blank range, exploding a zombie's head and sending guts and brain matter everywhere. Whoa! Zion cried, stepping back from the spray. Watch it there. Calvin chuckled. My bad, he said, and turned the rifle around. He used the butt to bang on the metal. After a few minutes of this, they backed away from the gate. Zion looked at his watch. 2.58 on the clock, he reported. We give this ten, and we're back on the move. Calvin found a spot behind the counter and plunked down on the floor, back against the wall. I'll take every minute I can get. Chapter 3 Matteo drove Brian and Michael towards the Bridge of the Gods. The SUV was silent, tense. Everybody focused on the task at hand. The headlights pierced through the darkness as they drove along the interstate next to the water, providing a little ambient light. As they approached the exit, Brian leaned forward from the back seat. This has got to be it, he said. He pointed to the water and the metallic bridge shimmered in the distance in the moonlight. Matteo nodded. Now we just have to hope this fingers feller is here. Almost afraid to ask how he earned that nickname, Michael said, earning a few light chuckles despite the somber mood of the car. Matteo swerved lightly as a few zombies wandered onto the exit ramp from the woods. He hit the brakes. Clear him out, he said. Brian furrowed his brow. Why? he asked, shrugging his lean shoulders. Just keep driving. We're gonna have our hands full as it is, Matteo replied. Do you really want things sneaking up on us? Michael shook his head and looked at his friend before shrugging. The duo got out of the vehicle reluctantly, surveying the two zombies that looked badly damaged, the forest having taken its toll on them. They grabbed baseball bats out of the trunk and casually walked over, each smacking down a ghoul and returning to the vehicle unharmed. Happy? Brian drawled as he slid into the back seat. Matteo pursed his lips, ignoring the man's sarcastic tone. He popped the vehicle back into gear and drove towards the meeting spot. As they crept through the tiny town, they looked down side streets, seeing movement on the far end. You want us to take care of them, too? Michael asked, a touch of ice in his voice. Matteo shook his head. Let's see what Fingers has to say before we start clearing out the whole town. They drove a couple more blocks before finding the hotel. It was a large five-story building with a few zombies in the parking lot. Brian leaned forward again, tapping Matteo on the shoulder and pointing to a small restaurant on the other side of the street. A man stood by the entrance waving at them, and they realized he was missing a finger and a half. Going to go out on a limb and assume that's Fingers... Brian quipped. Matteo drove over, and they got out, carrying their weapons. Fingers frowned at the trio. This all you got? All that could be spared, Matteo admitted. They're really scrambling to get people ready to move. He shook his head before motioning for them to follow him inside. Well, it is what it is, he said with a sigh. Come on, let me show you what I got. They walked into the darkened restaurant, the only light coming from an industrial-grade flashlight on a table near the back, away from the windows. As they walked, Michael stumbled over a corpse on the ground. Oh, yeah, Fingers said with a little laugh. Sorry, watch your step. Had to do a little handiwork to get this place secure. They navigated to the back of the restaurant where there was a table set up, there were a few bombs, two large and one that would fit in the palm of a hand. There was also a hand-drawn map on the back of a kid's placemat, showing the hotel, bridge, and immediate area. Have a seat, Fingers invited, spreading his arms. We need to run through this quick. When they complied, he held up the map. 
As I'm sure you saw on the way in, we have a potential shitstorm on our hands. We gotta clear out at least the bottom floor of the hotel and secure the doors. We also have a couple hundred of those fuckers roaming the streets that we need to deal with, too. Brian crossed his arms and leaned his elbows on the table. Man, why are we worrying about the hotel when this place is clear? Because there's too much glass, Fingers replied impatiently. The back door is completely gone, and the hotel across the street is wide open, so it would just be a constant stream of those things that we'd have to deal with one way or another. Not to mention, if they are bringing six busloads of people here, it would get pretty cramped in here. He cocked his head. Now, are you going to let me finish, or do you want to keep offering up ideas that are far beyond your pay grade? Brian clamped his mouth shut and lowered his gaze. Good, Fingers said, and leaned on his palms. Now, as I was saying, we have multiple problems and not a lot of time or resources to deal with them. He picked up one of the large bombs from the table, a pipe bomb that had been wrapped with a generous amount of nuts and bolts. Now, I got six of these bad boys which is how we're going to clear out street level. Which one of you boys is the fastest runner? Brian and Michael both immediately pointed at Mateo, the only athletic-looking one of the bunch. He shook his head. Fuck, he muttered. Okay, what do you need? We got two streets where the bulk of them are, Fingers explained. You get to run down, distract them, and bring them up to me. Mateo nodded. And where are you going to be? On top of a building at the end of the street, Fingers said. When they get close, I'm going to detonate the bombs right over their heads. The blast should go a long way towards luring them out. Mateo pursed his lips. And what about the rest? Fingers glanced at the holsters on either side of the man's torso. Here's hoping you're good with those, he said, inclining his head to the blades. Brian and Michael snickered and exchanged a fist bump, and Fingers eyed them with a calculating gaze. Not sure why you chuckle nuts are laughing, he drawled, because it's going to be your job to start getting those things out of the hotel. The duo sobered immediately. How do you suggest we do that? Brian asked. Michael threw his hands up. Yeah, and what are we supposed to do with that many of them? Fingers pointed to the ceiling in the center of the room. Four bombs dangled above them with a long fuse running out of the front door. As far as what you're supposed to do with them, he began. You lure them inside here and get out through the front before locking them in, and I'll handle the rest. As far as how, I really don't give a fuck. He spread his hands. Yell, shoot, do an acapella version of Baby Got Back. Whatever floats your boat. The two men stared at each other, wide-eyed with terror. Fingers laughed. Amazing how quickly you tough guys fold, he scoffed. Hope it's just you shitting your pants and not you realizing it's hopeless. They tried to respond, opening and closing their mouths, but no sound came out. Fingers grabbed the bombs from the table and another bag from the ground. He checked his watch and shook his head. Let's get a move on, he said shortly. We're gonna have guests showing up in an hour or so. Probably best for everybody if we're alone in this town. Chapter 4 Zion and Calvin sat out of sight of the zombies at the gate, listening as they moaned and shook the metallic barrier. After a few moments with no conversation, Zion checked his watch. 2.48, he reported. Break time is over, brother. You ready to start causing a ruckus? Calvin stood, readying his rifle. Let's do this, he declared. You figure out the plan yet? he asked. Zion shook his head. Out that door at the end of the hallway, you open fire, and we haul ass down the other side of the upstairs hall, he replied. Just gotta hope that there aren't too many of them standing in our way. And if there are? Calvin cocked his head. Zion shrugged playfully. Then it's been a fun ride. The sniper chuckled and smirked at his friend. You know, you might just have a future in motivational speeches. Zion clapped him on the back. Come on, let's roll, he said and they headed into the back room. They crept to the back door and cracked it open, peeking out into the hallway. It was clear, so they stepped out, walking briskly to the end. Okay, when we get out to the main hall, you start picking those things off on the far side, Zion said quietly. I'll cover you while you do. Calvin nodded firmly. How many shots you want? 
You just focus on firing until I tell you to move, Zion said. The more shots, the more of those things that are going to head out of the store. Calvin checked his ammo, making sure his rifle had been topped off. When he was ready, Zion peeked out the door, spotting a lone zombie about five yards away, with nothing else in his immediate view. He held up one finger to signal to his companion there was only one enemy. He threw open the door and rushed out, swinging his bludgeon fiercely, striking down the ghoul as Calvin slammed the door behind him and did a quick sweep of their rear, finding several zombies far down the hallway towards the other anchor store. Forget em, Zion said, smacking his arm. Let's move. They ran out to the main portion of the mall, straight towards a walkway over the large center area. Set up in the center. Zion barked. Let's do this! Calvin ran straight across, hopping up onto a bench and taking aim at the left side of the building. He quickly scanned, finding a zombie about twenty yards down. The first shot boomed, blowing the back out of the creature's head and alerting every zombie to where they were. As he found his next target, Zion went into sentry mode, looking in every direction for something to bash. His first one came up from the rear, a teenager in blood-tattered pajamas, about fifteen yards away from Calvin. He rushed it and swung hard, sending the lightweight monster tumbling to the ground. He turned and saw the group they had hidden from in the store was working its way up towards them. It was easily a thirty-strong horde at this point, too much to manage with just a bat. Another booming shot rang out, prompting Zion to glance to the other side. Zombies began to pour out of the stores with twenty to thirty stretching all the way down to the second-floor entrance to the garden centre. "'Gotta buy him more time,' he muttered to himself, and frantically looked around, spotting a large metal trash can on the corner. He did a quick scan, seeing that nothing was close to them. He rushed over, set his weapon down, and picked up the can. It was heavy and cumbersome, so it took him a moment to get a handle on it. Zion strained as he lifted it over his head, once he had it secure, he started jogging towards the mini horde as the shots from Calvin continued to echo. The zombies in front of him grew excited, seeing fresh meat coming their way. He stopped five yards short and threw the trash can as hard as he could. The first three zombies in the center of the mass were crushed under the weight of it. The force of the impact knocked several more down, creating two columns of undead. Zion raced back to grab his weapon. Reloading! Calvin called as the firing stopped momentarily. Zion scanned the rear, seeing a handful of zombies coming up the other side of the aisle, still about thirty yards from the crossover. He looked at the aisle they had to run through, finding still about forty creatures out along the entire route of the run. There were a few really thick packs in their way. Then out the big packs, Zion cried. Then get ready to go. Calvin nodded as he finished reloading and then took aim, firing some more. Zion turned to see the two columns of zombies were within ten yards of the crossover. He darted forward, swinging hard at the group closest to the railing. Instead of going for a headshot on the closest one, he swung deep and at an upward angle. The thick wood caught three zombies under the arm, the force sending them lifting off of their feet and tumbling over the side railing. Zion didn't look but he heard the thud below as they hit the floor. He quickly turned to the other column, which had broken rank and headed his way. He swung low and hard, taking out the legs from a few creatures, sending them to the ground. He ran back to Calvin, who fired off another shot. He looked down the aisle they were going to have to run through, seeing dozens of zombies, but a lot more spread out. We gotta move, Zion said. The sniper hopped down from the bench, both of them looking at the first floor. It was a sea of zombies, a lot of them pouring out of the garden center. You follow me and run as hard as you can, Zion instructed. Just push them out of the way and keep moving. Escalator is at the center of the store. If we get separated, meet at the top. Calvin nodded firmly. Lead on. They began their spring launching from the spot. The hallway was about fifteen feet wide and a hundred and fifty yards to the store entrance with corpses both standing and laying dead along the path. Zion was five yards in front of Calvin as he approached the first pack. Three creatures shambled towards him. He lowered his shoulder and barreled through them, clearing the path like a fullback for a running back. Calvin deftly hopped over the fallen corpses as they continued their run. The next thirty yards were relatively easy, as the creatures were spread out pretty thin. 
Both men ducked around them, the outstretched claws never coming close to touching them. As they reached the next crowded section, there were two batches of four, staggered, leaving only a small section in the middle to break through. Go right, Zion yelled. He broke towards the pack on the right, stopping just in front of them and swinging his weapon. The impact sent the lead two ghouls back into the others, all four slamming into the railing. Calvin didn't wait for him to get moving again, just run right by him and the fallen zombies. As he approached the next group, trouble arose. He ducked underneath the arm of an older monster missing a limb. As he came about, there was a corpse on the floor with a massive bullet wound to the head. He saw it, but not quite in time, his foot clipping the lifeless leg and sending him stumbling forward onto the ground. The zombie that had been reaching for him moaned in delight and moved in quickly for its meal. Calvin scrambled to get up, knowing he was in a bad spot. The creature's good arm reached out and grazed the fabric of the sniper's shirt, but Zion grabbed it from behind by the collar and belt. He let out an animalistic yell as he tossed the thing over the railing. Ain't no time to be lounging, Zion cried, grabbing his companion by the arm and dragging him to a standing. The two men took off once again, despite the route ahead becoming more crowded, with about twenty zombies in the immediate vicinity. Zion stared ahead, looking for a path through the mass of corpses that were standing nearly shoulder to shoulder and too deep. Calvin glanced to the rear, seeing the zombies they'd passed heading back in their direction. Whatever we're doing, we gotta do it now, he cried. Zion held his weapon horizontally across his body. Stay close, he instructed, and took off running like a shot. Calvin stayed hot on his heels as best he could as Zion extended his arms at the line of zombies. He hit three at chest level with the wood, and pumped his legs hard, driving right through the corpses, knocking them back into the second row. Both men leapt over the fallen creatures as their friends reached out to grab them. By a hair's breadth, they made it through the line and continued sprinting hard. The store entrance was just ahead, with only a smattering of zombies standing in their way. They navigated through them and rushed into the store. Escalators in the center, Zion screamed. They dashed through the store going straight down the main aisle in the center towards the frozen escalator, which was on the other side of a massive wall. As they rounded the corner, a dozen creatures greeted them, congregating around the entrance. The duo skidded to a stop and blinked in disbelief for a moment at the sight. Just once today it would be nice to catch a break, Calvin groaned. Zion looked around, spotting a shovel display just across from them. He grabbed one and held it out to his companion who took it. Gotta stay silent, Zion said, putting a finger to his lips. They stepped up, melee weapons in hand, and began their assault. Zion swung wildly, cracking skulls as Calvin went for a more gory assault. He stepped up to a younger zombie, a young redhead wearing a bloodied Super Garden Center shirt. He stabbed the shovel forward, driving the tip of the makeshift weapon into the bridge of her nose. The impact drove straight through into her brain, causing the zombie to convulse for a moment before slumping down. He kicked it in the chest, freeing the shovel from the corpse and allowing him to repeat the process on the next enemy. After several moments of smacking and stabbing, the immediate threat in front of them had been put down, although the moans and footsteps coming from behind them grew louder and louder. Zion led them around the wall to the escalator, seeing one more creature near the top of the stairs, stumbling about trying to navigate to a fresh meal. Rather than deliver a vicious blow, Zion gently shoved the monster with his weapon, sending it falling straight back off of the stairs. There was a loud crack as the back of its head impacted on the edge of one of the stairs. With the path to the first floor clear, the two men headed down treading as lightly as they could to minimize the noise. As they reached the bottom, they could see into the mall where hundreds of zombies lumbered around just outside of the store. They made the turn towards the truck, stopping at the sight of a handful of creatures still in the store. Run through them to the truck, Zion whispered. I'll load up the mowers and you handle anything that comes our way. Calvin nodded and held up his bloody shovel, approving of the plan. They darted out from cover, running as hard as they could down the aisle to the truck passing half a dozen creatures browsing the various garden departments, looking for brains. The footsteps alerted them to fresh meat, causing them to turn and head towards the duo. 
Zion reached the truck and quickly dropped the back gate to the trailer, giving him a ramp. The first mower was a beast, forcing him to use every ounce of his strength to get it moving. Calvin glanced over with concern as he heard his friend grunt with the strain. Keep watch! I got this! Zion hissed as he heaved the machine onto the trailer. Calvin nodded and went back to sentry duty, watching the zombies they'd passed coming their way. He quickly checked side to side to make sure there was no other threat, and then moved up to attack the first ghoul. With a quick swing of the shovel, the first attacker was down. Rather than continue moving forward, the sniper retreated to the truck. Zion got the first mower up, hopping off and immediately pushing the second one. Calvin watched the half-dozen zombies swell to about twenty in the main aisle. With the lead creature about twenty yards away, he swallowed hard, knowing this was getting out of hand quickly. Before he could move up to attack, he heard movement from his right. A trio of zombies moved through the potted plants, knocking over long dead plants with smashes and clangs. He frantically looked back and forth at the two front threats before dropping his shovel and retrieving his rifle. They're on to us! I'm going hot! he barked. Zion paused with the second mower and surveyed the situation, nodding. Do it! he cried and continued to push. Calvin aimed at the main aisle zombies, quickly squeezing off two shots, hoping that the fallen would trip up a few. He turned his attention to the plant section, the trio having grown to half a dozen and getting closer, within fifteen yards. He quickly fired, taking out the closest two before frantically shifting back to the main horde, which had swallowed up the fallen easily. He fired two more times, but heard Zion struggling with a gigantic mower, far bigger than the previous two. It looked like an industrial-sized one for mowing football fields. Calvin glanced back at the oncoming threat, knowing that no matter what he did, the enemy would be on them no matter what he chose to do. He broke from his defensive position and rushed back, throwing what little weight he had behind the mower. Despite his lean frame, it was just enough to get it moving up the incline. As soon as it was in place, Zion slammed the gate shut. You're driving, he said, and they bolted for the cab. They slammed the doors shut, breathing heavily as rotting flesh poured at the windows. Calvin turned the key in the ignition, and both men let out a sigh of relief as the engine roared to life. Buckle up, he said. This is going to be a bumpy ride. He popped it into gear and they started moving, a little slower with all the weight they were pulling. The corpse hands slid against the windows as they pulled away, leaving trails of goop and slime in their wake. The duo drove down the back aisle before making the turn on the opposite side of the store to head back to the mall. As they approached the entrance, they saw a horde of creatures in the hundreds standing in front of them. That is some densely packed trouble right there, Calvin said, swallowing hard. Zion licked his lips. All you can do is floor it and hope, brother, he said, extending his fist. Calvin bumped it and then revved the engine a few times before punching the gas. The truck gained speed, hitting thirty as they crashed into the front edge of the mass. Bodies flew about, a few embedded themselves into the front hood, brethren smacking off of their backs as the truck ploughed through. Zion looked back, seeing a couple of creatures reaching out, their hands shattered as the mowers slapped them on the way by. Come on, baby, come on, baby, Calvin muttered to himself. You can do it. The engine whined loudly under the strain, the constant mass of rotted flesh keeping their speed low. The truck bumped about as they ran over creatures, the sound of broken bones and moans coming from an undead carpet below. As they ploughed through, they could see light at the end of the tunnel, but the truck began to slow down. Calvin dropped the truck into four-wheel drive, giving them a little extra boost of power. Just before the edge, the truck groaned mightily, and the duo held their breath. Calvin closed his eyes and mentally urged the vehicle forward, and then the truck finally punched through the other side of the creatures. They let out a sigh of relief, and Zion turned to make sure the mowers made it. They were all still on the trailer, although they were a bit bloody. Calvin turned towards the entrance of the store so they could escape the mall proper. Gonna have to hose those things down when we get back, Zion said, facing front again. But they're in one piece. He checked his watch. And we still have two hours, he said. Calvin shook his head in disbelief. Holy shit, we might actually pull this off. 
We just gotta hope your lady is up to the challenge, Zion said with a smirk. His friend laughed. I'd put a lot more money on that than us pulling off what we just did. Zion joined him and shook his head. Ain't that the damn truth? Chapter 5 Matteo watched Fingers climb up the fire escape ladder on the single-story building on the corner. The building was large, covering the entire top of the block, reaching both streets with zombies congregating at the end. Once Fingers was up, he motioned to Matteo, who picked up a large metal pole from the ground and handed it up to him. Okay, Fingers' stage whispered down to him. Which side do you want to start on? Matteo looked around before motioning to the right, the street furthest from the hotel. Fingers nodded. Remember to duck at the alley so you don't get hit by shrapnel, he said. Matteo nodded and gave him a less than enthusiastic thumbs up. Clearly not thrilled with the plan, but there was nothing else to be done. He had a job. He peeked around the corner, seeing about eighty zombies standing a hundred yards down. A few of them were banging on a small business door, leading him to believe that at one time someone had been alive in there. Okay, this is easy, he thought to himself. Just jog down, clank your blades together, and waltz back to cover. Surely the seven-fingered man knows what he's doing? He sighed, realizing his life was in the hands of a man who needed to use both hands to pick up a glass of water. A moment later, a light whistle came from the top of the building, signaling that Fingers was ready. Matteo burst out from cover and began jogging towards the horde, pulling out his long knife and cleaver as he grew closer. The bulk of the zombies were focused on the building, a small mom-and-pop shop, with a trio of creatures on the outer rim of the mass, about ten yards away. With the nearest ghouls focused on the horde, Matteo came up silently behind them, swinging the cleaver and taking the head clean off of the first one before quickly stabbing the next one in the side of the head with his knife. The noise of the falling bodies alerted the third one, but before it could cry out, it took a cleaver to the face. While it wasn't too loud, the crumpling of rotted flesh hitting the pavement peeled a few more zombies from the mass. They shambled forwards, clearing a few yards before their moans really started to amplify. Well, if they're going to line up for me, then I'm going to take them out, Matteo thought to himself, and waited for the first creature to reach him. He lashed out quickly with his knife directly into the ghoul's eye. Two more creatures came up, staggered a couple feet apart, and Matteo delivered another swing of his cleaver, slicing through the top part of its skull. The moans and bodies hitting the ground alerted a dozen or so zombies who had begun to move in his direction. Rather than continue the fight, he slowly began to back up with the one remaining breakaway zombie keeping pace. Matteo surveyed the situation, a pack of a dozen behind the lone zombie, with a gap between them and the rest of the horde. Shit, he thought. They need to be bunched up more if that bomb is going to be effective. Matteo continued to backpedal glancing over his shoulder to keep track of his location and potential threats. The alley was now twenty yards behind him and coming up quickly. The zombies still spread out. Matteo glanced up on top of the roof, seeing Fingers standing there, waiting with the bomb attached to the end of the metal pole. He flicked his lighter a couple of times, letting him know he was ready to roll. Matteo nodded and lunged forward, coming at the main breakaway zombie. He grabbed the beast by the shirt and shoved it back towards the dozen, causing a few of them to stumble, allowing the rest of the horde to catch up to them, though eight creatures still remained broken away. Gonna have to do, he thought to himself, and jogged back to the alley. You think you can handle that tiny group? Fingers called down to him. Matteo looked down the alley about six feet wide, butting up against another building that ran the entire length of the block. About two-thirds of the way down was a large dumpster that had been flipped over on its side, blocking the route to the next street. Yeah, he replied. You just make sure you take those things out, though. I can handle eight. Eighty is another story. Fingers gave him a thumbs up. You just make sure you're clear of the street, he reminded him. Matteo continued to stand at the entrance to the alley, waiting for the eight creatures to close in on him. When they were ten yards away, he slowly backed into the alley, readying his weapons. As he backed up, fingers lit the fuse on the pole bomb, 
and began to extend it off the corner of the building, positioning it over the edge of the next building, dipping it down so it was right beside the wall. Mateo made it about halfway down the alley, zombies in pursuit, making sure he was clear of the blast. The first ghoul lunged towards him, and he stabbed it in the face with his knife, dropping it. The next two creatures were almost on top of each other, climbing on the other to get to their meal first. He swung his cleaver from up high, blunt edge down. The metal weapon cracked the top of the skull of the first creature, and Matteo quickly swung back up, catching his partner underneath the chin, cutting straight through the front part of its face. He continued to back up as the five remaining zombies navigated the alley and fallen creatures. Matteo grew tense, expecting a large boom to rattle his teeth, but it didn't come. He glanced up and saw fingers shaking the pole frantically, but no boom. Mateo's attention was refocused quickly when the moan of a zombie grew very loud directly in front of him. He snapped back just in time to face a creature lunging at him, forcing him to react by instinct. He dropped his cleaver and grabbed the zombie by the shirt, shoving it hard against the wall before jamming his knife through the bottom of its jaw. As it fell, he ducked down and grabbed the cleaver, just as another creature closed in. Mateo glanced back to see he was only ten yards away from the dumpster blockage, so he shoved the lead creature back as hard as he could, giving him some space. As it fell, he knocked down the next couple of zombies, giving him a view of the top of the alley. The main horde was there, beginning to filter in. Fingers! Mateo bellowed. What the fuck, man? He looked up to see Fingers pulling the pole back up towards him. As the bomb got close to the building, he cut the cord on it, dropping it to the ground below. He pulled out the small bomb and lit the fuse on it before throwing it down into the alley. Mateo panicked a bit, seeing a lit bomb headed in his direction, eyes wide. Twenty-second fuse! Fingers yelled. Small yield! Mateo realized what he was doing as the bomb clanged on the pavement between him and the oncoming zombies. He dashed forward, picking it up and tossing it underhand towards the closest zombies, rolling it just past them. He immediately turned tail and rushed back towards the dumpster, tossing his blades up on top before quickly pulling himself up. As he reached the top, the mini-bomb went off. The echo of the blast in the alleyway was deafening, stunning Mateo momentarily. The bomb ripped through several creatures, sending blood and body parts flying through the air. Mateo grabbed his blades and rolled off of the dumpster, landing with a thud on the ground. Stay behind the dumpster and keep it in place, Fingers yelled down to him. Mateo nodded and watched as his rooftop companion secured another big bomb to the pole. He quickly lit it and lowered it into the alley which was quickly filling with zombies. Mateo startled when the dumpster began to move due to the weight of the monsters on the other side, so he quickly pushed back. He strained against it, trying to keep the barricade in place, hoping that this next bomb wasn't a dud as well. Come on, come on, come on, he muttered, the words like a prayer. The bomb detonated with a blast exponentially louder than the smaller one, metal clanging like bullets ricocheting off of the dumpster. He flinched when several bits of the shrapnel crashed into the ground behind him. The weight on the dumpster vanished, and he relaxed his shoulders looking up at fingers. The man on the roof glanced down into the alley and nodded. He looked over at Matteo and gave a thumbs up, prompting him to climb back up onto the dumpster. The carnage was horrific, with dozens of bodies ripped to shreds in the alley looking like they'd been pureed with a blender. Some of them continued to move, writhing around despite having no proper limbs to do anything with. I'll go ahead and tell you right now, Mateo said, motioning to the zombie stew. I ain't cleaning this up. Fingers chuckled, and then moans sounded at the mouth of the alley. There were a dozen creatures down there still remaining, excited to get to Mateo. They slipped as they stepped into the carnage, unable to stay standing as they attempted to shamble through the slick debris. They'll be fine there, Fingers said. We need to worry about the other street. Mateo nodded and hopped down from the dumpster. He readied his blades as he approached the corner, peering out down the street. He was relieved to see that this group was smaller, about forty zombies or so, and they were all moving as a single unit, no doubt attracted by the bomb. 
They were still about fifty yards away and closing in. Mateo jumped when Fingers started talking, having moved just above him. This group shouldn't be too bad, he said. Mateo shook his head. That's what we thought about the last group, so let's not get ahead of ourselves. Yeah, sorry about that, Fingers replied, scratching the back of his head. What the hell happened? Mateo asked, raising an eyebrow. His rooftop companion shrugged. It was just a dud, man. They happen from time to time, he explained. But don't worry, they don't happen that often. Well, if it's all the same to you, Mateo began, pointing a finger at the street. I'll wait for you to take out this group from the comfort of the main road up there. My days of luring shit down alleys is over and done with. Fingers chuckled and nodded. Don't blame you one bit, he agreed. Just don't go too far, because I need you on mop-up duty once this thing goes off. Mateo gave him a thumbs up before making his way to the top of the street. He glanced back at the horde, thirty yards and closing slowly. After taking out your friends, you ain't gonna be nothing, he muttered. When he reached the top of the street, he looked back to see fingers extending the bomb out of the crowd. He took cover behind the wall, resting comfortably against it, waiting for the blast to shred them. Chapter 6 Brian and Michael knelt down on the edge of the parking lot by the street, taking cover behind some bushes. They surveyed the front of the hotel, a few dozen zombies lurking by the entrance. Brian pulled his hunting rifle from his back and looked through the scope. What do you see, bud? Michael asked. His friend focused on the entrance, seeing the double doors propped open, creatures coming and going as they pleased. There were easily dozens more in the lobby. Fuckers are jam-packed in there, he grunted. Big place, too. Lobby desk looks like it's about twenty yards back from the door. Michael sighed. Can you see the stairs? he asked. Too dark to find it on the wall, Brian replied, shaking his head. Can't see much past the front desk, since there's an emergency light over it. We just have to assume that it's wide open like the front door. Michael scrubbed his hands down his face. So, how the hell are we doing this? he asked. One thing's for sure, his friend replied, lowering the rifle. I'm not singing Baby Got Back. Michael shook his head. First good news I've heard today. We gotta figure out a way to get in there to secure the stairs, Brian mused, or else we'll just have a constant stream of those things. His companion looked over at a car at the far end of the lot. It was an older sedan with bloodstains all over the window. Come on, he said, waving his hand. I might have an idea. They stayed low while moving across the lot over to the car. They ducked down beside it, and Michael peered inside. He recoiled at the sight of a zombie in there, laying in the back seat, writhing around the leather. He pulled a knife, motioning for his friend to back up a bit retreating to the back of the car. He readied his blade before yanking open the back door. Thankfully, the creature was slow to react, giving him a chance to stab it in the top of the head. Brian came back from behind the trunk and crossed his arms. Congratulations, you killed one that was already secure, he said dryly. Michael rolled his eyes before patting the creature down, finally finding a set of keys in its pocket. He held them up and jingled them in front of Brian's face. Are you kidding me? His friend demanded, eyes wide. I know where you're going with this, and I wish you the best of luck. Michael smirked at him. You aren't gonna rock, paper, scissors me for the honors? You know damn well that only applies to riding shotgun. And who gets to hit on the hot girl at the bar first? Brian shot back, pointing a finger at him. Ain't nothing in there about suicide runs. Michael shrugged. Fine, be a little bitch, he said offhandedly. His friend glared at him and then waved him off. Well, it's your ass, he drawled. How do you want me to play it? Michael studied the hotel for a moment and then looked back into the car, spotting a large jacket in the passenger seat. I'm gonna plow right through the front door and then lay low while you draw them out, he declared. Once it's clear, I'll get out and secure the doors while you get them to the restaurant. Is that 
really how you want to do it? Brian asked, throwing up his hands. His friend bit his lip nervously, doubting his own plan. We're real short on time, he insisted, so I say we go for it. Brian nodded, and then both men jumped at the sound of an explosion in the distance. They glanced in the direction of the blast, not seeing anything before looking back at the hotel. The zombies jerked their heads back and forth, seemingly confused about the location of the noise. If that wasn't the big one, then we're in a lot of trouble, Brian said. Michael nodded and hopped into the driver's seat, door still open, turning the key and praying for good news. The vehicle wheezed a few times before it finally sprung to life. All right, he said firmly. Once I'm in, pull them out as quickly as you can. I'd rather not be a box lunch. Brian nodded just as another explosion sounded, this one much bigger, rattling the windows of the car. Despite being several blocks away, the sound resonated, and this spurred the zombies into moving away from the hotel. Go, Brian said and slammed the door. Michael popped the car into gear and sped towards the horde. He gained speed as he approached the front edge of them, about thirty yards from the entrance to the hotel. Bodies bounced off of the front end, left and right, as he struggled with the car to keep it aimed towards his target. The double doors were fairly wide, just big enough for a sedan to pass through if driven properly. Unfortunately, the zombies careening off of the vehicle caused Michael to have difficulty steering, and he clipped the right side of the door frame as he entered the building. The headlights illuminated the lobby, an upscale marble floor open space with formerly high-end furniture, now ruined by the undead. As he hit the marble, he slammed on the brakes, sliding across it and smacking into a few zombies before coming to rest just short of the front desk. He quickly killed the engine, and then laid down, pulling the jacket over him. He laid back, peeking out through the tiniest of openings, seeing a few zombies congregating at the window. They moaned, smacking their decrepit hands against it, seemingly unsure of what to make of the situation. Any time now, Brian, Michael thought, wrinkling his nose at the putrid scent of old, dead flesh in the car. As if on cue, gunfire erupted outside. Four shots went off in rapid succession, and Michael watched as the creatures by his window slowly lost interest in the car and wandered off towards the parking lot. Michael sat silently for another minute as the gunfire continued in the parking lot. He shifted in his seat so he could see out the passenger side, relieved to see nothing directly by the car. The lights reflecting off of the front desk illuminated the immediate area, but faded the further it got. He could barely make out the far wall, about thirty yards away, and he frantically scanned it for a door straining his eyes. He caught the faintest bit of movement, locking in on it and seeing a few more shadowy figures coming from the darkness, attracted to the noise outside. Finally, the reflected light caught the flashy tennis shoes of a zombie, lighting up the area just enough that he could see a doorframe. Got it, he thought, and focused on what he could make out of the door, disheartened that it seemed to be wide open. The door opened inward into a stairwell, and his stomach sank when he realized he'd have to reach in to get at it. He watched for another moment, seeing a steady but not overwhelming stream of zombies coming out. Before opening the door to the car, he reached up and yanked off the top light cover, smashing the tiny bulbs inside. The last thing he wanted to do was attract attention to himself by shining a light on his face. He slid out the door, taking a knee beside the back wheel. He readied his knife and unattached the top of his holster so his handgun was readily available, just in case he needed it. He studied the situation, seeing half a dozen zombies streaming from the door, spread out about five yards or so from each other. A quick scan of the lobby showed that it was the only source of the creatures. He looked outside, seeing the parking lot filled with them, the occasional gunshot and muzzle flash in the distance. As he psyched himself up to go... There was another large explosion in the distance, rattling the windows of the building. If they weren't coming before, he thought bitterly, they will now. He immediately broke cover, moving to the back wall by the desk and trying to remain hidden by the darkness. When he reached ten yards of the door, he broke off, running over to it with his knife in the air. The footsteps alerted a zombie a few steps away from the door, who turned and moaned, 
struggling to find the source of the noise. The lighting was just enough that he could see the monster, so he quickly stabbed it in the head. More moans came from the door, as well as behind him, as the body hitting the floor had drawn one of the zombies back. He darted around, grabbing the retreating zombie and throwing it towards the door, hoping that the impact would be far enough away that it wouldn't bring back any others. He stepped forward, stabbing the fallen creature. As he pulled the knife out, the first door zombie reached him, grabbing onto his knife hand with its rotted claws. Michael struggled to avoid the bite, twisting his wrist as he went. More moaning echoed in the stairwell, multiple mouths calling out in unison for a fresh meal. Fuck it, he groaned, and drew his handgun with his free hand. He put it right up to the forehead of the latched-on zombie and pulled the trigger. The sound echoed loudly in the small space and back into the lobby, immediately causing a number of creatures to reverse course. Michael didn't waste time knowing he suddenly had significantly less of it. He immediately dropped the knife to secure the handgun for better aim and opened fire on the zombies in the doorway. It took several shots to put down the trio in and around the area, but he dropped them. Moans and footsteps grew louder behind him, but he was more concerned with the echoing sounds in the stairwell. He darted forward, shoving the dead creatures away from the door so he could close it. There were several zombies on the landing above, staggering towards the last set of stairs. The excitement got to them, and the front couple bounced down the stairs face first, bodies creating cushions for their excited brethren to slide down. Michael went into overload, shoving the corpses as quickly as he could before grabbing onto the door and pulling it shut. One of the fallen creatures reached out, grabbing the base of the door as he tried to secure it. He kicked hard, freeing the arm, the sound of the door slamming like music to his ears. He whipped around to face the half-dozen zombies within a few yards of him. He raised his gun and fired three quick shots, dropping the lead ghoul. He aimed at the next one, but when he squeezed the trigger, there was only a dull click. He looked around frantically for his dropped knife, but couldn't find it in the darkness. So Michael did the only thing he could do, which was to try and escape. He ran to the back wall, moving up against it quickly to avoid being caught. The ghouls followed his footsteps, snarling with hunger. When he reached the front desk, he looked outside and saw a small wall of creatures moving back towards him, drawn by the handgun fire. He hesitated, knowing he'd never survive fighting his way out. He slid across the hood of the car, landing and quickly throwing open the door and leaping inside. He secured the locks and hid beneath the jacket again. He breathed heavily as one of the zombies reached the car, hands smacking wetly against the windows. Okay, buddy, he thought. I did my part. Now hurry up and do yours so you can come rescue my ass. Chapter 7 Brian watched his friend careening through the crowd of zombies in the sedan, disappearing into the lobby of the hotel. The bulk of the zombie horde in the parking lot began to turn around to follow the vehicle, prompting him to ready the hunting rifle. He took aim, honing in on the back of a zombie's head and firing. Due to the distance and darkness, he missed badly, but it didn't really matter. What mattered was that the noise got the creature to turn around and head towards him instead. Come on, bud, you can do better than that, he berated himself, and aimed again. This time his bullet punched through the zombie's face. He didn't stop to admire his handiwork, instead immediately firing at the next monster. After four quick shots, he lowered his weapon to get a read on things. The majority of the zombies were headed towards him, dozens of them, all shambling across the lot, the closest being fifty yards away. Well, at least this part of the plan is working, he muttered, and fired a few more times before pausing to reload. With his gun ready for action again, he stood up to begin retreating. He scanned the lot and made sure every single zombie in sight lumbered towards him. He ran across the street to the back end of the restaurant. The door had been completely removed, and it was a bit larger than a standard doorway because it was for deliveries. He darted inside, did a quick sweep to make sure it was still clear, and then took up position in the open doorway. He aimed his gun and fired a few more rounds, making sure the undead knew exactly where he was. 
As he stood and waited for them to get there, another bomb went off in the distance. Hopefully they're getting the job done up there, Brian muttered, and took a deep breath as the horde got within ten yards of the door. He backed up, remaining in the hallway leading to the kitchen, to continue to make sure the creatures knew he was there. That's it, he called. Come and get some. The first zombie made it to the doorway, with several others excitedly approaching behind it. Brian walked slowly backwards into the kitchen, a large area that could have easily housed a dozen line cooks. The monsters filtered into the building, and he fired off another shot to make sure the others kept on coming. The round hit a zombie in the shoulder, not slowing it down even a little. Brian reached the swinging doors to the dining room and kicked down the doorstop as he backed through it to make sure they stayed open. It took several minutes, but a few dozen creatures found their way into the dining room. He made his way over to the front door, waiting on the horde to get a little thicker before bailing out. When they were within breathing distance, he turned to leave, but several zombies pushed against the glass from the outside. He snapped back, pulling up his gun and firing. The bullet shattered the window on the door, dropping the zombie, but freed up the space for several more to push into the gap. Brian stood there, petrified and dumbfounded, until a rotted hand grabbed him from behind. The grip was tight, but his reaction was to jerk away, narrowly sparing him from a lethal bite to the face. He shoved the zombie back and retreated around the empty space on the side of the dining room. He frantically flipped tables towards the growing mass of creatures, buying him precious seconds. He looked around, seeing zombies coming down every available avenue of escape. He contemplated just making a run for the fire exit near the kitchen, but there were easily a dozen creatures blocking his path. As he frantically looked around, the zombies backed him into the corner. Panic set in as they grew closer. He finally turned around and began firing wildly at the windows. Three quick rounds pierced one, shattering it, and he ran as hard as he could towards it, putting his foot on a booth cushion and diving forward. The glass wasn't completely clear of the window, several shards cutting into his arms and stomach as he flew through it. He landed hard on the ground, the wind flying from his lungs, and he laid there, gasping for air. At the sound of footsteps, he struggled to flip over and aimed his rifle from the hip. Whoa, whoa, Matteo cried, raising his hands. Brian dropped the rifle with a gasp of relief, and Matteo and Fingers knelt down to help him up. "'Jesus, man, are you okay?' Matteo asked as Brian staggered to his feet. He looked down at his wounds and winced. "'It's not a bite,' he said through clenched teeth. "'I took a head out the window and took some damage.' Matteo studied him for a moment, checking over his wounds just to be sure. Brian grunted and shoved them away, bracing himself on his knees to catch his breath. "'Christ, man, you can strip-search me if you fucking want to,' he spat. Matteo raised his hands again, nodding. "'It's all good, man,' he replied gently. "'Can't be too careful, you know.' Brian nodded, his anger fading, as fingers stepped away to the front of the restaurant. He shook his head at the huge hole in the door. "'Supposed to be a barricade, dumbass,' he muttered, and pulled a lighter from his pocket. He found the fuse on the outside of the store and lit it, watching it vanish into the building." He headed around where his companions still were and found the other two fuses. You might want to back up a little bit, he warned, and lit them. The trio moved away from the eatery, heading towards the back and in the direction of the hotel. When they reached the rear, there were a few more zombies still pushing to get into the building. Fingers waved for the men to join him behind some bushes. We'll have a little clean-up to do, he said quietly but the bulk of them should be taken care of. Matteo nodded. Let's hope that this one isn't a... Before he could say dud, a gigantic boom echoed from within the restaurant. Every window in the building exploded, and part of the roof caved in. A fire licked the sky, illuminating the area. Finger smirked. You were saying? Looks like that fire is going to take care of our cleanup, Matteo replied. Fingers nodded. You're probably right, but just to be safe, he said, turning to Brian. Do you mind staying behind and keeping watch? The wounded man cocked his head. Where are you off to? 
he asked shakily. Go see if Michael got his job done, Fingers replied, and waved for Matteo to follow him. They headed across the street to the hotel parking lot. There were a few dead bodies on the ground as they approached the entrance, and five creatures banging on a car in the lobby. You think he's in there? Matteo asked, motioning to the sedan with his cleaver. Fingers shrugged. I think, regardless, we gotta take those suckers out. He drew his handgun and casually led the way into the lobby, as Matteo clanged his blades together to draw the zombies' attention. A few of them immediately broke away, shambling towards an easier meal. Matteo leapt forward and made quick work of them with his flashing silver. Fingers took the easy approach, walking up to the two creatures left that were still fixated on the car door, and executing them at point-blank range with a bullet to the back of the head. Matteo finished off the last remaining zombie on the passenger side, and then peered inside. Fingers knocked on the driver's side window. Hey, anybody alive in there? he asked. Michael dropped the jacket, giving a smile and a thumbs up before opening the door. Man, am I glad to see you guys, he blurted. How we looking? Just a few stragglers, Fingers said. Nothing more. Michael nodded as he got out of the car. Fucking A, he said with a sigh of relief. I got the stairwell door secured, but I haven't checked any of the back rooms in the lobby yet. It's all good, Fingers assured him. We'll take care of it together. As they turned towards the back, honking echoed in the lot. They turned around just in time to see two shuttles arriving, stopping just short of the entrance. They stepped out to greet them, and a red-haired figure hopped out first. Are we good? Wendy asked. Fingers nodded. Yeah, good enough to unload, he replied. We got a couple of stragglers to deal with, but we can manage. Are you sure? She demanded in her no-nonsense tone. He nodded again. Yeah, it's safe in the corner of the lobby, he assured her. We'll keep Michael on them as we wrap up. Besides, you still got two more loads to do. She turned away and threw her hand in the air, motioning for the buses to unload. All right, everybody, get a move on, she barked as people began pouring out. We're on a tight timeline here, people. Vulnerable civilians began to unload as quickly as they could from the buses, and Michael and Matteo corralled them into a corner of the lobby. Fingers stepped aside and sidled up next to Wendy, who turned to him with a stern expression. Do you think you're gonna make it? he asked quietly. She checked her watch. One hour and fifty-two minutes remaining. She pursed her lips. Hopefully Zion is able to come through with a delay. Chapter 8 Zion sat on the ground just outside of the parking garage. There were a couple of emergency lights set up on either side of the entrance, shooting out into the distance to make sure there would be no unwanted visitors. Hammering metal, yelling, welding, and grinding echoed from the garage as the students prepared the loppers to do their job. Zion looked down at his watch. One hour and eight minutes. Come on, Wendy, we need you here, he thought urgently. Ninety-minute round trip, you should be back here loading up by now. He stared out into the distance, jaw clenched, and there was a rustle behind him as Cheryl approached. Mind if I join you? she asked. He motioned for her to sit down next to him, and she did so, the two of them leaning up against the wall. So, how are we looking? he asked. Just heard from Wendy, and they're getting close, she replied. He checked his watch again, shaking his head as he did the math. What about Jermaine? He's still keeping an eye on the horde, Cheryl said. Said he was able to break up a good number of them. Zion rubbed his forehead. Did he define good number? He did not she said shortly, shaking her head. Let's hope that brother is being modest, he said with a sigh. We're gonna need a hell of a stand if we're gonna get everybody out of here. Cheryl nodded, curling her knees up to her chest. I know, she agreed. Just to play it safe, I've been prioritizing the most vulnerable being evacuated first. The last bunch heading out are mostly healthy people, with a few of the trainees. What about the hardcore experienced guys? Zion asked. She shook her head. Most of them went with the first load, she explained. If Matteo and those guys weren't successful, I wanted to make sure those people had a fighting chance. When did he say what the situation was down there? He asked. 
Cheryl drummed her fingers on her knees. She didn't, but it must have been secure enough for her to feel comfortable about leaving those people behind, she mused. Good enough for me, Zion replied with a nod. Tori poked her head out from the open garage door. Sorry to interrupt, she said. Just wanted to let you know that we need about ten minutes, and then we'll be ready to go. Thanks, Cheryl replied with a smile. They looking pretty good? Zion asked, raising an eyebrow. Tori pushed her glasses up her nose and shrugged. At the very least, it's going to be interesting to see them in action, she admitted. Never seen what a spinning blade can do to the human body, so silver lining, I suppose. Cheryl blinked at her in horror, but Zion simply smiled and chuckled. I can see why Calvin likes you, he said. Tori held up a finger. Speaking of Calvin, he said he could use your help, she said. Tell him I'll be right there, Zion said, and the small blonde nodded and headed back inside. He got to his feet and offered Cheryl a hand up. She shook her head. I'm just going to hang out here for a minute, she said. Just need to collect myself. All right, Zion said, lowering his hand. Just one thing, though. I want you on this next load. She immediately shook her head, eyes steely. I'm a leader, which means I don't leave until everyone does. You may be a leader, he replied, but I'm the leader. I'll be the last one out, which is exactly why you need to go now, he crossed his arms. If this last load doesn't happen, or if I don't make it out, these people are going to need you. She tried to open her mouth to argue, but he held up a hand. Wendy's a warrior, same thing with my sister, but you got something they don't, he said. She pursed her lips. What's that? You know how to bend people to your will, Zion explained. I don't know how receptive Edward is going to be to everybody coming to town, but I do know that if you got your verbal talons into him, there's a damn good chance it'll work out. She nodded, defeated. I'll be on this trip, she promised. You have my word. Zion gave her a firm nod before heading into the garage. There was a hive of activity as the four kids worked hard on the mowers. Each of them had a tall metal pole sticking out of the front engine block, with a few civilians helping them out by holding stuff up for welding. A few people brought in weights from the gym, setting them on top of the mowers. As Zion watched on, he noticed Calvin waving at him beside the truck. Tori says we're under ten from heading out, Zion said as he approached. Calvin nodded. Sounds about right, but I need your help with something first. Ain't no time to be playing wingman, his friend teased. The sniper rolled his eyes. Well, I already got the girl, so I don't need a wingman, he drawled. What I do need is your brute strength and thoughts. What you thinking? Zion asked. Calvin motioned for his friend to follow him to the far corner of the garage. There was a huge stack of cinder blocks there, maybe forty or so. I was thinking we got that rebar in the truck that we were going to use as a last resort to stab these fuckers, he said. But what if we could trip some of them up? Zion furrowed his brow in confusion, shaking his head. Calvin grabbed two blocks, setting them down on the ground about six feet apart, the holes facing each other from side to side. Now picture that with half a dozen rebar bolts through there, he said, motioning. Stack them too high, put a few at the back to reinforce it. Probably ain't going to last too long, but it could very well trip up several batches of them. Every minute counts, you know. That's true. Zion replied thoughtfully. But the problem is that there's not going to be a way to secure them to the ground, so they're just going to get knocked over. Calvin's face fell. No worries, man, he said. Just trying to think outside the box. He started to walk back, but Zion continued staring at the blocks. Hold up, he said, forcing his friend to stop. Your original idea might not work, but we can still use these. Calvin turned to him. How so? These things are heavy and rigid. Zion said, so if I was to throw them off of the back of the truck, I could knock some of those things over. The sniper grinned. Zombie cinder block bowling? Hell yeah, Zion replied with a chuckle. Go get one of the trucks out of the main lot and bring it around back. We'll start getting it loaded up. Calvin nodded and ran off. Zion perked up when he heard buses honking and made his way outside as Wendy jumped out of one of the shuttles. Here for the next load, she announced. Zion checked his watch. One hour and two minutes. Cutting this close, ain't you? Next time we'll have to steal something that has more than a go-kart engine in it, she snapped. I'm sure Fingers and Calvin can whip something up, Zion replied. Assuming Fingers is still kicking, that is. The redhead nodded. 
He's good, as are the rest of the boys, she reported. They did good down there. All right, let's move, Cheryl bellowed from the doorway. Move your ass like your people's lives depend on it. Civilians rushed out of the parking garage, carrying bags full of possessions, all they have left in the world. Zion turned back to Wendy. Now you hurry back, he said. We're going to buy you as much time as we can. It was 88 minutes door to door, including unloading at the hotel, Wendy replied. Add three minutes to get the next load on here, and five minutes to get past the crossroads. Zion wrinkled his nose. If you want to speed a little, I won't complain, he said. They shared a nod, and she retreated to the buses. He checked his watch again, clearing the timer and putting in ninety-six minutes, clicking start as they drove off. He stared at the ticking numbers, and his heartbeat quickened a little. The final goal was in sight. They had to make it. Chapter 9 Two trucks sped down the interstate, ready to encounter the horde. They didn't have to go far before they ran into Germain, who was in the middle of the road, waving them down. They were about three quarters of a mile away from the crossroads. Calvin and Zion manned the cinderblock truck, and the college kids drove the trailer truck. Man, I was starting to get worried, Germain cried as they pulled up. Zion leaned on the window. You know I always come through, he replied. So how far out are they? he asked. About five hundred yards up, Germain said, pointing. Can't miss them. Zion nodded and cocked his head. You thin them out good? Kinda, Germain admitted, scratching the back of his head. There are some big packs in the front and some brakes, but they filled back in a bit. I used everything I had against them. Zion held out his fist. I know you did, man, he said, and after a firm fist bump, he got off of the truck. Calvin slid over into the driver's seat and Zion sauntered over to the second truck, where Jack sat behind the wheel. Okay, start getting set up here, he said. Tori leaned over from the passenger side. I was thinking we set one up here and retreat about a hundred yards before the next one, she said and pushed her glasses up on her nose. Gives us a chance to adjust our strategy if we need to. Have at it, girl, Zion replied, nodding. Your boyfriend and I are going to ride up ahead to try and slow them down a bit. He checked his watch. Eighty-seven minutes. We need to keep them on this side of the crossroads for eighty-seven minutes. So do what you need to do. Tori gave him a thumbs up as Jack began a three-point turn so that the trailer was facing the horde. Zion headed back to Calvin's truck and hopped up into the bed, waving his hand in the air. Let's move it, he cried. Calvin popped it into gear and drove slowly down the interstate. The headlights cut through the night, and it wasn't long before they caught a glimpse of the horde. Thousands of zombies stretched across the northbound side of the road, with a few on the other side of the median, all moving as one. Zion shook his head as he saw there were only a few breakaway groups that had swelled in strength to several dozen each. Well, looks like those Molotovs were a bust, Calvin called through the back window. Zion clenched his jaw. Hopefully the cinder blocks won't be he said. Get me in position. His friend spun the truck around so that Zion faced the horde. The red brake lights illuminated the immediate vicinity, but didn't cut too far into the distance, only about ten yards or so. He picked up a cinder block and tested the heft in his hands, loosening his knees and waiting for the undead to get within striking distance. The moans and footsteps grew louder with each passing second. After a moment, the first creature stepped into the light. Ghouls bathed in a hellish red glow. Zion immediately lobbed the cinder block at the first creature he saw, smashing it in the face and knocking it to the ground. Inch it up every few seconds, he called back to Calvin. The sniper complied, basically letting off the brake and allowing the truck to move a bit on its own, in reverse. Zion chucked a few more blocks at the front edge of the horde, knocking down creatures and causing several more to stumble. Gotta break these things up, he thought and then began launching several cement blocks into the darkness, hearing the impact crunching bones he couldn't see. After several throws, he smacked the hood of the truck. Let's get back to the line, he said. Gotta see how the lopper works before we use any more of these. Calvin sped up, driving a couple hundred yards up to the first machine. Harold and Missy were there with Jack, making the last-minute adjustments. The first mower was the smallest one they had, enough for a small home in the city the most extended up from the engine, 
with two metal bars sticking out, one of which just cleared the seat and the other a foot above that. They were staggered, looking like a weather vane. Let's get this thing started up, Zion said. They'll be here in just a couple of minutes. Harold motioned for Missy and Jack to back up as he turned the key on the engine. It roared to life, idling nicely. He ducked down so he was below the seat before flipping a switch on the control panel. Then he crawled out of the way as the metal spokes began to rotate. The three college kids hopped into the back of the truck with Zion as they watched the contraption pick up steam, rotating rapidly. They could hear the blades whipping through the air like a chopper. Zion nodded in approval. That's certainly going to leave a mark, he said, and smacked the roof. Back us up, Calvin. The sniper moved, and then they stopped about forty yards from the mower, turning the truck around so that the headlights could illuminate the battlefield. They anxiously awaited the arrival of the horde. It felt like an eternity for them to arrive, with Zion constantly checking his watch. It was nearly ten minutes later before the horde came into view. The lead zombie shambled towards the weapon and was quickly met with a metallic blow to the face. The impact tore off the front part of its skull, dropping the creature to the ground. More creatures met the same fate, blood and bones spraying everywhere, the moans drowned out by metal whirs crunching bone. The college kids let out whoops and began exchanging high fives, vibrating in their seats. Don't get too excited, Zion said tersely. They're coming around the sides. They sobered and turned to the mower, and while it did an admirable job of knocking down creatures in the center of the highway, hundreds of creatures walked past it as if it wasn't even there. Calvin popped the truck into reverse and backed up a little as the ghouls got closer to them. As they moved, the mower began to rock back and forth from the constant impact of the blades. Within a few more seconds it became completely unstable, flipping over onto its side, crashing to a halt. Jack pressed his hands to his forehead. My God, what did we get? He groaned. Fifty? Sixty? That's not going to do it, Missy added, crestfallen. Zion checked his watch. Seventy-two minutes. He glanced at the crossroads, seeing it in the distance. He shook his head. No way in hell we're making this, he muttered. He looked back at the next mower in the middle of the road, about a hundred yards from their location. Calvin, get us to the mower, he barked. The sniper complied, backing up as quickly as he safely could. They reached it, and the college kids hopped out of the back to help Tori and Jermaine set up the next lopper. Zion leaned out the window. I need you all to move that to the next lane, he said, pointing to the mower. I think it's more effective in the center, Tori replied, pushing her glasses up her nose. Zion nodded. Normally you'd be right, but we gotta do something drastic, he replied, and inclined his head to Calvin. Get the truck across this lane he instructed, pointing out the window. What? His friend gaped. Get the truck across the lane, Zion demanded. Push it up against the end of the concrete median. Calvin shook his head, but didn't question him, turning and nosing the vehicle against the concrete. Nothing but grass on the other side. Make sure those blades have enough clearance on the truck, Zion said as he hopped out of the passenger seat. Jack scratched the back of his head. A horde that size is going to push through this truck in no time. Unless I'm up there keeping them off of it, Zion replied, and the group all froze. Are you crazy? Harold burst out, eyes wide. Those things will swarm over you. Zion simply pointed to his watch. Sixty-eight minutes, he said firmly, and they're seven hundred yards away. I know those things are slow, but they ain't that slow. At least let us stay and fight with you, Jack said helplessly. Zion shook his head. Nope. He pointed at the kid. You need to get the big mower set up back by the crossroads and figure out some other way to slow them down. I'll be all right. Harold waved him over while the rest of the group reluctantly piled into the trailer truck to get ready to retreat to the crossroads. Okay, the kid began, motioning as he spoke. When they start getting close, you need to turn it on here and flip this switch. Just make sure you stay low because those things will kick right in. Zion nodded and extended his fist for a bump, and Harold awkwardly bumped him back. The older man chuckled and waved for him to run back to the truck. After a nervous nod, he took off, and Zion stared towards the coming horde, still a hundred yards away. "'Looks like I'm gonna have to go all Gandalf on your asses,' he declared. "'You shall not pass!'
Chapter 10 Zion checked his watch. Sixty-one minutes. It seemed like an eternity when the forces of the dead were marching towards him. Seven hundred yards, give or take, he muttered. Seven minutes per hundred yards, which means I still need to buy twelve minutes. He knelt down besides the mower as the ghouls crept within fifteen yards of him. Let's get this beast started up. He turned the key and hit the switch before rolling out of the way. Within seconds, the blades rotated rapidly, the breeze from the whipping metal blowing cold on his face. He nodded, bouncing from foot to foot, psyching himself up for the upcoming battle before hopping up into the back of the truck. He inspected the cinder blocks, seeing about two dozen remaining as well as a few lengthy pieces of rebar. He picked up the first block, looking at the coming horde. Zion took a deep breath, pulled his arm back, and then flung it forward, sending the cement flying through the air. It went about four rows deep into the horde, cracking a ghoul in the face and dropping it. He didn't waste any time, continuously grabbing blocks and lobbing them as far as he could, doing everything he could to create gaps in the crowd, trying to relieve the stress on the machine. After half a dozen throws, the first batch of zombies reached the truck, gently pressing up against it reaching out for Zion's legs. He stepped back as far as he could and threw a couple more blocks, creating little pockets within the mass. He picked up a piece of rebar and began using it like a spear, forcefully jamming it into the skulls of the zombies at the edge of the truck. The first few slumped over the edge of the bed, giving him a buffer from the reaching monsters behind. As he did this, the first batch reached the lopper, delivering on the promise. Luckily, the blades rotated away from him, so the body parts shot into the wooded area beside the road. With the zombies directly in front of him taken care of, Zion went back to tossing blocks, this time focused on the groups approaching the mower. He lifted one over his head and threw it almost straight down, knocking over several creatures before they reached the spinning blade of death. The process went on for several minutes, Zion taking a breather from throwing blocks to resume his rebar attack, thinning out his area so he had room to operate. But eventually, enough of the thousand-strong horde pressed up against the truck that it began to move. Zion threw more blocks, knocking over creatures closer to the truck than the lopper, which allowed for the ghouls to bunch up around it. There was a repeated sickening thump, thump, thump from the mower as a batch of zombies entered the kill zone all at once. He glanced over to see it start to wobble, the pole causing the engine to smack up against the interior walls of the mower. Just as another group of creatures walked into it, he saw it failing, and knew it was time to abandon ship. Zion leapt from the back of the truck, narrowly missing one of the blades that broke off and snagged the bed of the truck. He darted forward several yards before stopping to turn around. The machinery held back the bulk of the horde for nearly a minute, before the weight of the ghouls forced a hole between the mower and truck. He looked at his watch. Fifty-four minutes. He nodded to himself, pleased with what he'd managed to accomplish. Just need five more, he thought. Hopefully the big boy Lopper can do it. He turned and jogged back to the line near the crossroads. It only took a few minutes to reach the college kids, doing some last-minute adjustments on the massive Lopper in the middle of the road. Holy shit, man, you okay? Calvin blurted, approaching from the truck. Zion nodded. Yeah, that was not a lot of fun, he admitted but it did buy us some time. He glanced at the mower and noticed they'd attached six-foot chains to the bottom rung of the blades. Is that going to work? he asked. Missy shrugged as she checked one of the connections. In theory, she replied. Good enough for me, Zion replied with a nod. He looked back at the truck and trailer and inclined his head to Calvin. How much rebar we got left? he asked. The sniper shrugged. I don't know, fifteen sticks or so? Let's hitch it to the trailer. Zion suggested, motioning as he spoke. Jam it through the side so it sticks out as far as possible. Calvin cocked his head. What are you thinking? We still gotta buy at least five minutes, Zion explained. And even with the upgrades, I don't think the lopper is going to be able to handle it. His friend nodded, recognition dawning on his face when he realized what he was suggesting. So you're gonna sacrifice the truck? He asked. Don't worry. It's Fingers' truck, remember? Zion asked with a lopsided grin. Calvin opened his mouth and then closed it, 
thinking for a moment before shrugging. That's a good point, he admitted. But what happens if Wendy doesn't pick us up? Then you're going to have to show a leg, because we will be hitchhiking, Sion quipped. But if it makes you feel better, he turned and cupped a hand around his mouth. Jermaine! His companion ran over, cocking his head. What's up? he asked. I need you to go to the crossroads, Zion said. When Wendy shows up with the transports, I need you to tell her we need a ride. Jermaine gave them a thumbs up. On it! As he ran off into the darkness, Zion clapped Calvin on the shoulder. Come on, he said. We got work to do. Chapter 11 There were eleven minutes left on the clock as Calvin slammed one more bit of rebar into the side of the trailer. Nearly a dozen spikes stuck out of both sides, with four feet of reach. Zion hopped into the truck and carefully pulled it around the lopper, setting it up in the middle of the road. All right, we're good, Calvin announced. Save us a few pieces of rebar just in case. Zion held out a hand to Jack as he hopped out of the driver's seat. I need one of those weights, he said, and a little chain if you got it. Jack grabbed a twenty-pound dumbbell and a few feet of chain from the lopper, bringing it over to him. Zion used the chain to tie the wheel down so it remained in position. He looked up, seeing that the horde was within fifty yards of them. All right, stand back, Zion warned, and Jack took a few steps back. Calvin, however, jogged forward. Hold up a second, he said, and darted to the passenger side, opening the glove box. He pulled out a bottle of whiskey and headed to the hood where he poured it all over the truck and then lit it up. Zion nodded in approval. Bonus fire damage, I dig it, he said. Calvin jogged back and Zion leaned into the truck, popping the engine into drive. He looked back at the rebar, seeing just how far he needed to get to avoid being torn to bits. He took a deep breath and then tossed the dumbbell onto the gas pedal. The tires screeched as he dove back, narrowly missing the rebar as the truck sped by. The flames illuminated the path as the vehicle of death tore off towards the horde. It picked up speed rapidly, slamming into the front batch of zombies. It lost a little speed but ploughed through a good portion of them. The rebar on the side didn't deliver kill shots, however it was forceful enough to lop off legs, slowing the shambling dead. Zion held up a victory fist, a few of the kids letting out hoots of excitement as the vehicle tore through the zombies. Harold, hit the lopper, Zion declared as the ghouls still standing ambled on. Harold hit the switch before rolling out of the way, the extra length of chain making the machine extra dangerous. The group rallied behind the monstrous machine, watching as the truck vanished from view, overtaken by the dead. The front edge of the pack slowly made its way to the lopper, the group holding its collective breath that the chain enhancement would work. The first zombies came into range, and the tip of the chain took off a ghoul's jaw, lopping it off into the woods. More creatures poured into the kill zone, losing chunks of flesh before their skulls cracked. The heavier machine held its own, not losing its balance just yet. However, even with the extended reach, there were still pockets where the monsters could slip through. Rebar! Zion cried, and Calvin tossed him a piece. He ran up to the coming zombies on one side, spearing one through the chest and driving it back into the reach of the chain, taking off the back part of its skull. He swung wildly, doing everything he could do to hold the monsters at bay. Calvin pulled out his gun and began shooting on the other flank, picking off creatures one by one. You four, get back to the crossroads, he barked. Tori clenched her jaw and stared at him with a worried gaze, but he shot her a wink before turning and continuing to fire. The kids retreated, leaving the two warriors alone to stem the tide. The battle went on for several minutes, with Zion pushing hard to keep zombies from breaking the line. Eventually, the lopper grew overwhelmed from turning the zombies into puree and began to wobble. Watch it! Calvin warned, and Zion glanced over, darting back just as the machine went haywire. There was a deafening blast of metal on pavement, shredding several dozen zombies as it gave its last bit of strength. Zion ran back to Calvin, the duo standing forty yards from the crossroads, looking on at the coming horde. He looked down at his watch. Four minutes, he said, and raised his chin. You think we got it? Calvin clapped him on the back. Without a doubt, brother, 
he replied, without a doubt. They shared a fist bump and prepared to make a final stand to hold off the horde. Once the creatures were within ten yards of them, honking cut through the air behind them. Zion and Calvin looked back, seeing two shuttles sitting at the crossroads. Wendy flicked on the internal light, showing that everyone was aboard. The duo didn't hesitate, turning and sprinting for the buses, leaving the horde in the dust. As they reached the door, the redhead put a hand on her hip at the top of the stairs. You boys need a ride? she asked. Zion grinned. Fuck yeah we do, he replied. Wendy pointed to the other bus. I think your girlfriend is on the other one, she said. She's cute. You should hang on to her. I intend to, Calvin declared, and then ran off to the other bus as Zion zipped up to join Wendy. She patted the driver on the shoulder. Let's roll. The buses rolled across the crossroads safely, and Zion checked his watch. Two minutes left. You're early, he said with a smile. She shrugged sheepishly. We may have sped a little. Zion flopped down in a seat in the front row, shaking his head. The reality of the situation fell down on his shoulders like a ton of bricks. I can't believe it's all gone, he said, scrubbing his hands down his face. Everything we built just obliterated. And all those people we left behind. Wendy sat next to him. Who? Like Adam and his group? she asked. We got him well stocked up so he can ride it out until we get back. Or whoever sent those damn missiles. Would be nice if they came and lended a hand. Nah, this is on us, he replied, eyes darkening. God help whoever sent those missiles if they ever run into me. She studied his expression, watching the quiet rage boil up in him. Rather than press the issue, she patted him on the leg gently. Monique is going to be happy to see you she said, hoping to defuse him. When he simply continued to stare out into the darkness, she got to her feet. I'm going to go check on the others. It'll be okay, Zion. Just be thankful we got so many people out safely. He nodded slightly, his chest burning with the anger building towards the people who destroyed his town, his community. It won't be today, he thought. It won't be tomorrow. But soon, someone is gonna pay. The End Up next, the invasion of Seattle begins as Sergeant Copeland leads a daring mission to the north of the city in Seattle, Part 1. <laughs>